Welcome to Stage Dive, a podcast where we go deep on the art of live performance to help artists perform better on stage. I am your host, Jack Dawkins. I am a rapper, poet, and storyteller out of Boulder, Colorado. My guest for today's podcast is Wally G, who might be the most notorious ping pong or table tennis, depending on how you want to call it, player in the entire world. We had a beautiful conversation in which we talked about mental health, about overcoming struggle, about what to do when times get tough, and what it means to really be a performer and to embody performance no matter the context. Wally has an amazing story. He was on over 200 podcasts uh, within the last year, so I'm so glad he joined us. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Wally G. So I, I had a first question, which I will get to eventually, but I have a different first question now, which is tell me about the plaque behind you. Oh, yeah. So um, I used to intern like a long time ago. Um, it, it, it was crazy because it, uh, it was an internship, but it wasn't like a normal internship. Like I actually got yeah. paid and I used to work for Hype Williams. Okay. The, the hip hop music director. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So you got a plaque for being an intern with Hype Williams, which yeah. is dope. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Who's the artist? Oh, shit. I actually forgot. Uh, I think yeah. it was, <laughs> oh, D'Angelo. I always forget. D'Ang- nice. D'Angelo. Like, it D'Angelo. just sits yeah, there. Yeah. It's been sitting there. It always sits there. Sometimes it falls, but it just sits there. So I just keep it there for fun. And it makes a good background. For sure. I mean, well, it, I, it immediately drew my eye. I was like, I want to know this, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah. plaque. Tell me yeah. all about it. So originally, like, I never used to keep it up. I, I used to um just um it used to be in in some boxes with some other shit that I had, but sure. but when I started doing lives, especially like TikTok lives, a yep. good practice is to put something behind you, that's just fucking so different than what you do, and then people it draws people like people what, like what's going on, and that keeps people on the live longer, and then people and it gives something a question, it gives people uh, something to ask. Mm, that's yeah, yeah. I mean yeah yeah guilty as charged I would say that was ten out of ten yeah, in yeah, effectiveness yeah, yeah, yeah. that worked pretty fucking well that worked super well especially in um, lives like when you're doing lives like anything yeah like, like a bug like a fake bug on the wall like just Funny. sitting here like people look at that and they're like what's that you know is there a roach yeah. that's Little amazing um, how often do you go live for TikTok um I was going live a lot before but that's when I was doing my. So my other passion is mixed martial arts. Okay. So so that was my big passion. Like UFC, I, I'm like all about it. I I know almost as much as Joe Rogan knows about the UFC. Like I, yeah. I'm in that shit hard. Um, and it was and that live was really good. Like I used to have like maybe two thousand people in my live every time. Wow. But then TikTok started getting crazy with it. At first, they were like it's violent, and so they started banning my lives. And then mm. and then uh eventually they came up with like a copyright thing because what I would do was I would show, I, I buy all the um, pay-per-views, right? Like all of them. I watch every, every single fight. And uh, so I figured if I'm watching it, I might as well let everyone else watch it too. So I tell everybody, come on, let's watch the fight. And then it's a way I practice to do commentary. So I actually commentate, I commentate the fight as it's going on. Right. And then I sure. turn and the thing is, I thought it would be fine because I tell people two things. I say, one, uh, no disrespectful stuff, nothing else. I'll boot you from the live. And don't gift me. So I tell people purposely, don't gift me. I used to always say, don't gift me, don't gift me, don't gift me. And the reason I say don't gift me is because I don't want to make money from the live. You understand? Yes. Right? So I thought that would be fine because I would tell them, don't gift me. And, and people don't gift them. I, I, I'll say, all I want you guys to do is just be respectful in the comments. And um, let's talk about the fight. And that's what I used to do. And it, and it was it was like, you know, up and down. It was good for a while. And then it started getting banned. Then it started getting real good. Then it started getting banned. Then it started getting really, really good. And then one day I woke up and it said, your account is permanently banned. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I spoke to, I, I, knew, I know a guy who works on TikTok. And, and he got my account back for me. It's yeah, a good so, friend to have. So, so I don't do it anymore. So now it's just me going on some random stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who's your favorite fighter? Oh man, wow! In UFC. So I'm gonna go with Izzy. I like, even though he lost the belt, 
I, I, I just like the way he fights. He, he fights smart. I think as, as a mm-hmm. fighter, the idea, of course, people want to see you go in there and, and, and bang, right? And we all love the bang. But at the end of the day is how do you win the fight with taking the least amount of damage, right? Mm-hmm. So that you can have a long career. And he's the expert at taking the least amount of damage, like the yeah. expert, and he wins. And people don't like it, but at the end of the day, you know, you have to preserve your body. And, and he's very good at, he's very good. At, he's, he's like Mayweather. He's very good at not getting hit. Yes, yes. Well, and like, and people don't like it in the comments, but he still gets views. Yeah. Like if Izzy's on the card, people are going to buy the pay-per-view 100% exactly. of the time, right? Because like when he's pressed, if he has to, he will fight. You don't know if he's yeah. going to because he can get out of fights without yeah. doing very much. But you know that if it comes down to it, like he'll throw. He'll throw, you know, yeah, yeah, throw. yeah. Like he's, it's, it's, and the funny thing is, it's not like he hasn't knocked people out. <laughs> he's he's TKO people, so it's it's, mm-hmm. it's 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 uh, yeah. But I know he he gets a lot of shit. But um, anyway, that's been like a really interesting time now because you know both Nigerian guys lost their belts, which is right. You know, the whole thing is just weird, man. <laughs> Well, it was three of them, right? It's not all Nigerian, but Nganu is sort Nganu, of like he left, he left. And then Kamaru lost it. Kamaru and then Izzy lost, lost it. And it right. Like, and then right Oof. before that was, I remember, was, um, 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 oh, my God. Now I can't even. So, um, the Lioness, Amanda Nunes, had earlier right. lost her belt. She got it yes. back. So I knew she was going to get it back. I was like, yeah. there's no way that girl can beat her. But I knew she was going to get it. But she lost it. And that was right. the three major losses coming up. Yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy. Did you watch the um, the Islam uh, Volkanovski fight? Yeah, that was fucking. What do you think? What do you so, think? So, so, a lot of people, a lot of people say Volk won, but I, I don't think Volk won. I think because the fight was so close, and Makachev had most of the control, most right. of the control. He had, and uh, that's why I think they gave it to Mark, to Makachev. He yeah. he controlled most of the time, right? Uh, Volk. The takedowns were important. I mean, he didn't get a lot, but he did have some significant takedowns. Um, I think damage-wise, you can say it's equal, but control-wise, definitely went to him. And I think that's why they... Because if anything, everyone, everyone was like, it's fixed. I was like, no, it's not fixed. It's not it fixed. benefits the UFC if Volkanovski won in his country. Like, that's yes. huge, right? Yes. So it, 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 it's it's it's... It's a very, very close fight, and I, I think by the slightest hair, Makachev got it because of the control. That, right. That's what I think. Go it ahead. was a better fight than I thought it was going to be, honestly. I, I, it was I know a great Okanowski fight. He's a beast, but I didn't think he was going to be that good. <laughs> I just Was it after the first round? He's like, he's not that strong. Yeah. And this I, is a guy who was manhandled everybody, and he's like, eh. <laughs> You're just like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> like, that's... The, the thing that I thought was so interesting about that fight is like it was a perfect like juxtaposition between what you're saying of like what Izzy does, which yeah. is like fighting smart. Because like from, a, from the, an emotional standpoint, from a fighter standpoint, like it was Volk every round. Yeah. He wanted it like he was talking shit. He was throwing things. He was talking to him when he was tied up. It was like he never stopped the entire fight. Like as a fan, I was like it was Volk all day. But yes, at the end yes. of the day, if you're wrapped up in someone's arms for two full rounds, yes, you're gonna lose the scorecard. And like, scorecard, right? like it or not, that's that's how it works. But I, the, oh, that fight was so good. I, I wanted Vogue to win, but you know, I agree with you too. Also, also, from emotional standpoint, he won that by far. Like he he, he was Miles. never he was always always hyped. Even when he was holding him, he was looking back talking shit to him. Remember that he's looking at him yeah. talking to Josh, yo. But yeah, but I, I was surprised, man. I, I, I mean, I gave him like so much respect. Like, and the guy, the guy's a beast. But I didn't know. I, I, I thought, I thought it was gonna be Makachev, you know, on yeah. a higher level. I, 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 I thought he would take him down easily. That's what I thought. He'd take him down, and he could barely take him down, man. It was, I know. Holy, I know. that was like wow, man. I know. Oh but they gotta God. run him back. Oh, they of, run yeah, they absolutely have to run it back. That, that's a huge fight, run it back. Well, and to their credit, I think the fact that they gave Volkanovski pound for pound was yeah. smart because Volkanovski ran roughshod over his whole division Everything. over and over and over again. And then nearly, like so close to grabbing another division 
that's pound for pound, a hundred percent. And like, again, his performance, his emotion, like that he was never tired. He was never nope. defeated. He was like, if that, if the last round had been another 30 seconds, he might've knocked out Islam. It was, yeah, it was maybe. so yeah, yeah. close. It was, it was so close. close. Very close. Um, all right. Let me, let me switch gears a little bit. So, right. uh, you, you did 200 ish podcasts last year. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Between last year and now, maybe more. So what, what, what are some of the things you have learned either about yourself or about the art of podcasting after doing 200 of them in the oh, last man. like 15 months? So I, I learned a, a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, I mean, eventually I'm going to have my own podcast, right? Eventually down, down the line. And, uh, I learned different ways people ask the same question. Mm. Um, I learned uh, how, like there's things that I can tell when a podcaster is actually steering you into giving the answer that he's heard before. Like, these are the things that I think if you haven't done a lot of them, there's no way you can even know what's going on. You're just answering questions. But right. for me, like I get the cues, like I, I get them right away. Like when, especially, especially this one, when a podcaster has heard you talk before, because sometimes when you're telling a story, there's so many components to your story. And, um, uh, certain parts of the story come out at certain times, but he might want a certain part that he's heard before. And I get the cue right away. Like when they're starting mm. to, to, to guide you. And then I do the same thing too. So I just, I was having this conversation with someone um, the other day and I was like, sometimes I have to lead the podcast when it's a podcaster who's new, right? Because mm. I've been on so many and a lot of times um, the newer podcasters either do two things. They either ask question after question after question after question after question, and it feels like you're going for a job interview, or they do nothing, and it feels like you're talking too much. And so what I do is uh, I, 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 I read this right away, and then I know uh, the amount of, of, uh, of things that I want to say, and I'll just stop. And when I stop, that's order, giving them a cue to... Some people pick it up really quickly. Some people are like, and then they talk, but that can be edited, right? And and, and so yeah, so I've learned a lot, and 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 then I also learned um, how how important it is to tell your story over and over and over and over and over and over again, because Preach. like you never know who's listening. I keep saying this because I since since I've been like telling my like really telling my story, like. I get all kinds of mail. I get I get all kinds of DMs, like serious stuff. Like I post on my Instagram. My last post uh, talks about this. You know, someone who 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 um, was going to commit suicide, and they heard me speaking mm. in a clubhouse room. And and um, when when they heard it, they kind of paused and they listened. And then uh, the, the later on that day, I got a, a back channel in clubhouse, like a DM saying that. Um, that they heard me speak and, and, and that, um, they were, uh, it, it, it kind of, you know, made them think and they were on the way to get something to, or to do something to end their lives and hearing my story inspired them. And they said that, um, they're, they're not, it's not that they're not going to do it is that I've given them 24 more hours to think about mm. whether they want to do it or not. And, and that, and that's those, and those things are kind of powerful, you know, and hearing stuff like that on a regular, you know, like this, it just makes me want to always tell my story. So if one person hears it and they get inspired by it, then, you know, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like, for what it's worth, I, exactly as you said, like, even if it's only 24 hours, that's still a huge difference. Even if it's just planting the seed that like, maybe I don't want to do this. Like right. that's a huge gift to that person. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, like, I, I think everyone has a story. I think everyone should tell their story. That's my opinion. But like, I know a lot of people are resistant to do that. Yeah. What, what was the process like of you deciding that you wanted to start sharing your story? Like what, what changed for you that made you want to put this out in the world? Um, I think, I think the most important thing that made me want to tell my story more was the pandemic. Right. Mm. Um, because I've told my story a little bit, but I didn't really tell it, tell it. Right. Um, 
during the pandemic, um, we didn't have anything to do. And, 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 and I was home and, 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 you know, I was like, all right, I need to do something, you know, something impactful or something. And then I thought, you know what, um, maybe I should do more podcasts because I had been on a few podcasts, you know, you know, like this, the Alter, the Alter Church show, you know, I've been on a bunch of TV shows and stuff like that. And, and once I said the word podcast, you know how your computers listen to you. Right. So, so, so <laughs> I, do. I used to use Facebook. And then what, what happened was, is that, um, these, these ads would pop up on my Facebook and it would say podcasts, um, five podcasts in five days. And it was that guy, Steve Ulsher. And, 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 and he, he, it, it was ads to become a podcaster. Right. But I didn't want to become a podcast. I just wanted to go on podcast and tell my story. And, um, then, um, somehow they had something where you pay a hundred bucks to get on a zoom call with a bunch of podcasters and they talk, whatever. And I say, you know, okay, maybe that might be worth it. So I did that, got, got on, uh, told my story and everybody was like, oh my God, you got to join the Facebook group. So I joined the Facebook group. And then someone was like, Hey, there's this app called clubhouse. I put a basic thing of my story and he said, you got to jump on clubhouse. And so everything I do, I do with intention. Like, like I, I don't do things that I don't want to do. And I don't do things just to do them for no reason. And so I said, okay, well, if I'm going to jump on this clubhouse app and spend a ton of time on it, I'm going to be putting in work. And that's what I did. Like mm. I literally put like people were like, man, how'd you get so many podcasts? I'm like, yo, I bust my ass. I was on the app 24 hours a day, every single day, nonstop in every, listen, in every room, like I started to develop um, a, 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 a technique where no matter what room I went into, no matter what it was about, I would find a way to answer their question in a way that it related to my story. And that's how I answered mm. every single question in Clubhouse for like the first year. And I and then I would go into podcasting rooms, you know, be a guest, find a guest. Boom, and I would talk. And I just kept putting in where I kept talking, 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 I kept, talking I kept telling the story. And people started, you know, writing back and and, and yeah, and, and, and that's how it happened. And then through the process, I started learning different things you know, about podcasting and, 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 and guests and, and uh, hosts, how every host, like I said, every host is different. Every host has a different approach uh, to certain things. And, and, and I think a good podcast is when it's like a conversation. That's what I feel when things are kind of like smooth and, if, and it's natural and, and no one's not like, no, or, you know, people just feel comfortable. And so mm -hmm. I learned how to be comfortable. That's one of the mm. things that I learned during the process, like how to be just comfortable. And, and if I feel that the podcaster is not, um, I don't know, not making me comfortable, then I know how to lead. I've developed how to lead the podcaster so that we're both comfortable. Yeah, so right. it, it's, it's been a really good learning experience. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, um... I, I so agree with what you're saying. And I think um, whatever your opinion on, on Joe Rogan is or isn't, like I, I think something he taps into that not a lot of people talk about or, or not, whatever. Like the reason his conversations are so long is because there's no pressure. There's no stress. There's not like, I got to get through this list. We got to get to this. Like, nope, we're just hanging out. Yes. But w because of that, people start to relax and then they start to actually talk about what they want to talk about. And then people share these really interesting insights. It may take you two and a half hours to get there, right. but like, that's why he gets so many amazing quotes and moments from that podcast is because it's like fishing, right? It's like, yeah, you don't just yeah. fucking throw the line in and take it out a yes, hundred yes, times. Yes, you yes, let yes. it sit there. Things swim by. And then every once in a while, like, Ooh, man, you get a fucking amazing bite. Um, yeah. He and got, I think, got, like, I don't want to call it a lost art, but go ahead. He got, he got Kanye to say some real dumb shit. <laughs> and I, did you see He's that He's gotten one? a lot of people to say did some really that? dumb shit. And, and, and he was sitting there like, what did you just say? <laughs> god, I know. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. my God. He's, I mean, he's, he's definitely, he's definitely uh, one of the people whose podcast I want to be on in the future. Um, because he For also sure. could say he's part of... Uh, the whole MMA community as well. Um, well, right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that style. You know, I, 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 I like that conversation. I've seen some of his podcasts. Yeah. Some of the guests are corny, though. 
they, they're not as cool as I am. And I, I keep typing that. Like, <laughs> like, like I used to go to his page and troll the page. And I'd be like, bro, can you stop putting these people on and get some real people on like me with real stories, bro? Come on. And I was just, I was just typing. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that style. It's super cool. And, and, and everyone just seems relaxed. And it's yes. funny. Everyone seems so relaxed. They start saying shit that they, that they shouldn't be saying. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, a, I mean, like the other show that I think does that so well is Hot Ones. Like, I don't know how the fuck they came up with that idea. Have you seen that show? I don't know. Which one is that? Oh. So it's a show called Hot Ones. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. And the basic idea is that like the host and the interviewee eat chicken wings that oh, get yeah, yeah, progressively yeah, that. spicier. Yeah, yeah. And by the That's end, they're so flustered because of the chicken, they'll fucking say anything. anything. And they're super vulnerable. And the interviews are amazing. And it's like, I don't know what crazy genius came up with that idea, but it gets to vulnerability, which is all we're chasing in these. Like just right, an right. honest conversation. It's like, ah, oh, so good. It's so good. Um, let me go back for a second. So the way you were talking about TikTok Live, and you're like, you can put something in the background and it gets questions. And it's like, and then you were talking about Clubhouse and you're like, and I found these strategies, I did these things. So like, it sounds like the way your brain works is you find something and you get locked into it. And you're like, yes. I'm going to fucking take this apart and figure it out. Like, tell me more about that. Where does that come from? Yeah. So, so, so yeah, it, it, it yo, it, it's so crazy. It's so crazy that you said that um, because I'm a type of person uh, because I have a lot of things to do, I kind of put other things off. But then when I get to them, it's like lock and mode, and I become, I become uh, uh, in, insanely crazy about just getting it done. And 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 I think that came mm. because, uh, you know, as a kid, you know, I grew up with this crazy, abusive, narcissistic stepfather who used to tell me every day that you'll be dead, you'll be in jail, you'll never be successful, you're a failure, you're worthless. And this is every day, like every single day is what I heard as, as a little kid. Like he would even, and a lot of times, you know, like and I always say this all the time, um, most times you hear this stuff is when the parent or step parent is angry. But a lot of right. times he wasn't angry. It would be me coming home from school and he would say, how was your day? Oh, it was good. He goes, yeah, it doesn't matter because you're worthless anyway. Like like just trying to, to, to um, uh, program my brain to believe this. And um, I think be because of that, you know, uh, as I got older, I had to find peace because it used to make me angry just thinking about it. And I used to get so defensive and people were like, oh, you can do that. And I get really angry and, and I get de you know, defensive. Um, so what I started to do is I started to channel that dark energy into positive energy. So whenever I have a problem or a situation or it's difficult, I go back to those words you know, you're worthless, you're useless, right? Because I hated my stepfather so much that I never in my life want anything for him that he said to become true. And and mm. I think that's where that comes from. Like, like if there's something I want to do, I can't fail. Like, I don't believe in, I don't I actually don't believe in failure. I, I don't, I, I, I don't believe in failure. I, I think maybe something doesn't work out. Uh, you take something from it, you learn, then you didn't fail. It's, it's, it, it's, it's called uh, losing, but winning anyway, right? Yes. You lost, but you won anyway because you took something from it. And now you can take that and go back to the drawing board and make it work. So so I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about that. Like even yesterday, uh, two days, well, it's been two days now. I posted today. I, I had a video that I shot a while ago for a friend of mine whose child uh, passed away uh, mm -hmm. from CHD. And um, I, met him, I met him on TikTok. I met him on TikTok. Um, and and we, we became pretty cool. And he invited me to his his uh, online TikTok online uh, memorial. And so I had this video, and I said, I, oh, I told myself I'm gonna make a video for you. And I hadn't done it for a while because this has been a little while now. And then yesterday, or two two days ago, I said, all right, I'm gonna do this video. And then once I put it on the computer, it was locked in. And then I had some issues with the numbers because I wanted. I wanted numbers that would change to every hit of the ball from both of us. So you have mm. to manually do that. And it took forever. Then I messed up. But I, I spent literally like a total of 12 hours or more on this video that's literally less than one minute because I was just honed in. I was focused. I got to get it done. I got to get it done. 
this morning woke up started it finished it and posted it yeah so yeah i think that's where that comes from just uh hearing my stepfather's nonsense yeah oh that's so interesting and i like i, I also couldn't agree more like i think it's funny as i get older not that people come to me for advice often, but when I see people starting in music, starting in art, changing career, whatever it is, you know, what advice do you have? Blah, blah, blah. Literally don't quit. Yeah. That's it. Like if you just keep trying, even if what you're trying at doesn't work, you will learn something about yourself or the world that will better inform what you do next. So like you wanted to be a lawyer and you're not a good lawyer. It doesn't fucking matter. As long as you learn, I'm not a good lawyer because I hate, legally or i hate this right, part of right. it or i'm not good at building relationships awesome go somewhere where you don't need that skill or build that skill like now you have a new decision tree right yep. like that's fucking life it's like just don't quit <laughs> that's the no, whole the whole game it's the whole game i i, I agree 100 percent. yeah it's um that's so interesting so like it, you the, you describe this process of like taking that negative energy and channeling it into positive like, I imagine that's something that took practice over time. Like, how were there times you were frustrated? Were there times when, like, it doesn't feel easy to do? Like, how do you get through the, the tougher moments when it feels like that voice is louder than you want it to be? Um, it's, 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 it, it's always the same scenario. Like, like I, I always go back to that dark place. It's, it's, it's something that I always do. Um, mm -hmm. Like before, just thinking about it used to make me angry, right? Uh, and then, you know, when, like a little backstory. Like when I was younger, I was a very violent kid. You know, I was in gangs at an early age. By 13, I owned six guns. So I was an extremely violent kid. You know, I, 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 I almost killed my stepfather. And then I almost killed my mom for turning against me to protect him who was beating her up and choking her. So, you know, I went through a lot of insane craziness. And, and um, like I said, uh, there's no person in the world that I would hate more than my stepfather. And if things were hard for me and I gave up, then I, would, I could hear in my head that you're useless, you're worthless, you know, mm. you'll never be successful. You'll fail at everything you do, right? I can, you know... I always tell people when you go through this kind of trauma, right? You, you, it's not like it leaves you, right? The trauma in your head that it does, never leaves you. You'll be 80 and it's still there. It's how you deal with it. So I was able to, like I said, turn it, turn it around. And um, it's, when I hear that, it makes me push. You know what it's like? It's like when you're playing a sport or, or, or when you walk into an arena and the crowd goes, boo, like that. Right, you know, a great athlete doesn't go like, "Oh my God, they're booing me." Shit, no. Oh, you want to boo me? Now you just pissed me off. Now I'm a 360 dunk on your whole team. You know what I'm saying? So, right. so, so, so it's that kind of thing. So when I hear it, so when I'm when things are stress, right, I'm gonna hear it. it's gonna come in my head. Everything I go through, I hear that voice always, always. It's especially it comes always when things are difficult. Right, so when things are difficult to me, the first thing that my mind thinks about is your failure. And then I'm like, oh no, 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 it's not gonna happen. Nope, nope. And I just, I just, I just pump up and and, and I figure, okay, what can I do differently? What can I change to make this outcome different? You know, who can I talk to? What what can I do? And I always try to figure, how can I make this better? What can I do differently? I hope you're enjoying my conversation. I just wanted to send a few notes your way about things I have coming up. On April 7th, my next single is coming out. It is called Writer's Block. It is my first collaboration with a producer from Toronto named Ugly Fun, and it was an incredibly uh, exciting and joyful process to make it with him. He has such a unique sound, and I'm really, really excited to share that with you. And then secondarily, I have a show, if you happen to be in the Denver area, on April 14th at the Marquee Theatre doors at seven show is at eight uh i will be opening up for tune mac yeah that makes a ton of sense um i th i believe in the idea that like our energy has a vibrational quality to it and we attract the things that are similar and we repel things that are different so like as you were going through this change of like 
you were in this very negative environment, there was violence, there were guns, you were in gangs, and then you stepped into this more positive mindset of I can achieve, I can do, like, tell me about how your life changed, like what it used to look like, and then kind of what some of the changes were as you went through all that. Yeah. Um, so when I was younger, um, like I said, you know, I was in a gang at an early age. And the reason why I was in a gang was because, you know, I had this abusive stepfather used to beat up myself and my mom and uh i needed an outlet right so and i needed and, and i needed sort of a family so 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 the gang was my family that those were the people that 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 i could kind of talk to right so that was one balance the other balance was sports so i had the gang life and i had the sports the sports is what tired me out right because like i said i was this violent high energy kid and i needed the balance and that was sports so I would join every single team in school because, you know, we practice in the morning, go to class and practice in the evening. By the time I get home, I'd be numb to the nonsense that was going on. Mm. And so that was, that was sort of like my uh, balance. And um, things didn't change for me until I found ping pong, which is such a weird thing because nobody in the hood plays ping pong. I mean, yeah, they do, but it, it's not like, you know, it, it's, 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 it's nothing like professional or anything like that. You might, you know, get some people playing for fun, holding sure. the racket like this or something. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it was the sport. The, the, the sport is what changed my life. And okay. yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy, you know? I found the sport that I hated. Actually, and I actually hated, I hated ping pong. They had it in my high school. I used to make fun of kids playing this every day. I used to play football, basketball, tennis, volleyball, wrestling. And I would see these kids in the lunchroom playing ping pong, and I would make fun of them every single time I saw them, every single time. And somehow, you know, like 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 you never know what your life holds for you. It can be the very thing that you hate the most mm -hmm. can be the thing that completely changes your life and takes yes. you to that next level. Yes, yes, that's so true. I think there's um there's a Brene Brown quote and it's about people, but I think the idea holds was like it's hard to hate people close up. It's yeah. I think it's hard to hate a lot of things close up once you actually really start to understand the nuance and the detail and why right. people love it, and all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, this is a lot, this is a lot cooler than I thought. So wait, right. like, did you have like a mentor figure? Did you just start playing one day? Like, how, what, yeah. what what how do you how do you get into so, it? Oh, so so the way I started was really funny. Um. I was shooting pool as a break from sports in school. And uh, I thought I was really good at pool, but I actually sucked. Had this really nice pool stick that I stole. And um, I got upset, hit the pool stick on the table. This pool stick shattered. And I looked over and there were some kids playing ping pong. And that was going to be the people that I was going to go mess with because I blamed everyone else for everything that happened to me, I blamed other people for. Mm -hmm. So me breaking the stick somehow was these kids that were playing the sport that I hated, it was their fault. So I really? go over there and I tell him, I says, listen, I want to get a hit. And the kids say, you play this? I said, I don't play, just give me the paddle. So he gave me the paddle and I went on the other side of the table. Now the whole point of hitting the ball was to hit him in the face with the ball. That was the goal. He hit the ball to me, I hit him in the face. It looks like it's a mistake. I say, sorry, that's it and walk away. And I get my aggression out. But unfortunately, when I went to hit the ball, the ball went on the table. And the kid was like, oh my God, that's a crazy shot. That, that's amazing. And, I, and he was like, there's a ping pong club. You should go check it out. And I was like, what do you mean there's a ping pong club? He said, yeah, there's a place where people, I said, what do you mean? There's a place where people get together and they play this? He was like, yeah, I'm telling you, you got to go check it out. They, they're really good. And I was like, this kid's crazy. But the athlete in me <laughs> wanted to check it out. Like the athlete was like, yo, maybe there is a place where people play. So I went to this place and when I got there, I saw people actually playing, like standing far from the table, hitting right, the ball, right, boom, right. making noise. I was like, whoa. And the more importantly was that it was people that looked like me. Mm. It was black people playing ping pong. And I was like, there's no way black people playing ping pong. I was like, this is crazy. Because for me, ping pong was only a thing that Asians did. Like black people did, didn't play ping pong. I didn't see no black people play ping pong in my life. Right? right. So I thought it was only Asians. So when I went in there and I saw it was all black people playing ping pong i was like whoa maybe this is a good sport right and and then that's how i got interested so i got interested that way and then i met a guy uh first nobody would really play with me this old guy would there, there's an old guy that would play with me sometimes he's about 70 
and the guy used to beat me so bad. 70 years, listen, I was a top athlete. I played basketball on a high level, football on a high level, tennis, wrestling, you, volleyball, you name it, all MVP on a high level. And this 70-year-old guy would beat me at ping pong. And I would get so angry and so, uh, you know, really angry. And that made me want to play more, right? Because I said, there's no way this 70-year-old guy can beat me at a sport. It's impossible. Right. So then um, eventually I met another guy who came in one day and says, hey, do you have a partner? And I was like, no. He goes, listen, I visit back and forth. Um, I want to uh, pay you 20 bucks for every time we play. And at that time I was like living in the streets. And I was like, okay, 20 bucks. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. So I would play with this guy and um, we talked a lot and, and you know, I, I talked about my life and, you know, how bad it was with, with the family and, 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 you know, about my gang life and, and, you know, we became pretty close and um, for him, it was more like TV, right? Because if you don't know anyone who lived that life, it's very hard to understand um, how it's possible that a kid at 13 could have guns, right? No, no right. one can even idea. But for me, it's something that's normal. Like, it, it, if you tell me, yeah, this kid, 13 years old, had a gun, he killed two people, I'd be like, oh, okay. It's sad, but it, it, I'm not like, oh, my God, really? Whoa. No, because it's something that's so normal. And um, one day I went to the club, and a uh, 22 fell on my bag, and he saw it. And uh, immediately I thought, okay, this guy is just going to, you know, have nothing to do with me. I lose my $20. But he calls me two days later and he goes, hey, are we still playing? And I was shocked because why would a guy who just saw a gun fall on my bag, after everything I've been telling him, say, are we still playing? Not only did he say that, when I met him, he goes, I want to invite you to my house. And I thought it was really weird that this same guy wants to invite me to his house. I wouldn't invite me to his house, <laughs> right? And um, it was just weird, man. And, um, you know, at his house, I got to see his family like live like a family, you know, right. eat together and talk together and pass food together and, and, you know, smile. And, 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 and so I think he was trying to give me the sense of what family was. Mm. And then uh, he says, I really want to help you. I'm going to pay for you to go to Germany to learn ping pong. And that's how I started to go on this uh, ping pong journey was he paid for me to leave the circle I was in because he probably knew that I was going to be dead or in jail and right. he got me out of it. And I went to, I went and lived in Germany for six months. Wow. So wait, how old were you when this happened? So when this happened, I was 17. Okay. Okay. And like, did you have a moment of doubt or was he like Germany and you're like, great. No, let's go. No, no, no it's definitely not great. The only thing I knew about <laughs> Germany back then was Hitler. I didn't know anything about Germany. I, I didn't know. I just knew Germany. I knew Hitler was from Germany. And I was thinking, why is this guy trying to send me to Germany? <laughs> like, what the hell? Is this guy was to send me to Germany. But, but, you know, I was always a smart kid. Like, I was always smart. And I always knew that if I didn't find a way out, that I would be dead or in jail for life. So I, I knew that. So when I saw this opportunity, you know, I, 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 I thought that there, there's no way this could be any worse than what I'm going through mm. right now. There's no way this could be any worse than what my life is right now. And, 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 and I took the opportunity. I, like, I, I, you know, I, I was thinking maybe it was crazy, but I said, no, I'm going to do it. Right. So then I'd be able to get away and get out and go to a totally different place and, right. and try to start over. Right. Well, and again, like it's, it's bucking against the story that your stepfather was telling you. Right. Because if you were a failure and you were worthless, you couldn't possibly be going to Germany to learn to play ping pong. The two don't add up. And so it's like, it's another, that's so interesting. So wait, were you in Berlin or like where, where in Germany oh, no, no. were so, you? So I first went to Hanover. Okay. So the first place was, was in Hanover. I lived in a school, a sports school with uh, kids who played different sports. And these kids um, were the elite of that area. So they, these, these kids are either looking to be uh, Olympic yep. uh, athletes or pro athletes, right? So in, in, in different sports. And so it was, um, in the beginning, it was really difficult because, you know, just, just because they sent me to Germany didn't mean that I was 
not this violent kid anymore, right? I was still a violent kid. I was just a violent kid in Germany. Right. And, um, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it, it only started to change when, you know, there, there's, there's this saying, it's called killing you with kindness, right? Mm-hmm. This is a real thing. Like, people, like, if you never uh, uh, felt this, it's so, it's one of the most confusing things ever. It's almost like if you're really angry, right? And you want to punch someone in the face and the person goes, but I love you. You're, you're like the most amazing guy in the world. The person is like super uh, 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 genuine about it. How do you punch that guy in the face? Mm. You can't punch that guy in the face, right? But there's a problem. Where does that anger go, right? I can't punch him in the face. The ang- it's not like, oh man, yeah, thank you very much. But no, the anger is still there. But the anger can't come out. So now the anger is even, it's trapped inside. And mm. so when I was there and people were like, oh my God, you're, 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 you're amazing. You're so cool. Oh, you're from New York. Oh, you're from America. Wow. For me, it was a little difficult, right? Because I was a kid that wanted to punch everyone in the face. And, mm. and, and the anger was just inside. And when they were being nice, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to react, right? Because they're being nice. And the idea is not to be nice to me. The idea is to talk shit to me. So then that way I can get my aggression out. But I right. couldn't get it out. And so for like the first month, month and a half, I was just like really confused. And, and I didn't know I didn't know who the hell I was anymore. And then um, eventually, uh, I, I always talk about this like uh, angel or divine intervention or whatever you want to call it, came and says, hey, why are you upset? Why are you angry? You're not in America. You're not in your gang, you're not with your abusive, narcissistic stepfather. You're in a totally different country where people like you because you're you, not because you can pick up your gun for them, only because you're you. That's it. What the hell's wrong with you? And then it wasn't until then that I started to really deeply understand and say, yeah, man, why am I angry? Why? I mean, people here, they, they genuinely like me just, just because I'm me and I'm American. That's it. They don't want nothing from me. And so then that, that was the first mindset change. And I started to open up and started to be nicer and, and, and started to try and, and, and make friends. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. Like the, the visual I'm getting is it's like, it's not necessarily that it was one thing that made you change. It was all these little things, right? right. It was like, it was him seeing the gun and still calling you. It was going to dinner. It was the opportunity to go to Germany. It was going through that experience of being like, I don't know what to do with this anger. And then right. ultimately this sort of like, call it whatever you want, conversation with God or spirit or internal wisdom that was like, hey, look around. Like, life's pretty good right now. And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's like that, right, right. That, that moment of awareness. That's so interesting. This, the like, whatever, it's my podcast, podcast, I can do what I want. It's technically about performance. Like, so when you think about performing in the context of ping pong, like, what does that look like? What do you, what do you want to see from yourself when you're having like a great game or a great match? So, so, you, you know, it's funny. It's great that this, this, this podcast is, is about performance, right? Because I'm an entertainer. And it took me a while to understand that. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. When I first started playing this sport, I was the worst. I was the worst pro in the world. Really, in the world. I was the worst pro player in the entire world. And everyone knew it. I was this black kid from the projects who did hip hop at the time that was trying to play a sport that I had no business playing at the highest level, right? And um, I would travel from America to China, America to Germany, all these countries and get destroyed. And Mm. people would constantly say to me, why are you playing this sport? You should be rapping or you should be playing basketball. First of all, I'm 5'8". There's no basketball for me, right? That's that's not happening. You know, I had basketball dreams before, but I didn't grow. And people would, people would like be hard. Like, why are you, why are you wasting your, your, your time? Mm. Right. And then I would tell them, because, you know, anything I want to do, I'm going to do it. I just developed that character over years. And I would tell them, I would say, hey, are you number one in the world? And they would, and they would say, no. I said, how many people can be number one in this world? And they would say, one. And I would say, then why are you doing it? Right? So I would, mm. I, I would just turn stuff around. 
right? And then I realized, like, the reason why I was losing so badly was because I had the wrong mindset, right? In my mind, I believed I was the best athlete in the world. And, you know, being MVP at every sport I ever played kind of suggests you are probably one of the best athletes in the world, right? right? But this was a totally different sport. And I wasn't respecting the sport. You know, I started this sport at 17 years old. And 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 um, I had to change my mind. I, I was thinking that I was going to go in there, I was going to beat everyone, and I was going to be the number one player in the world because that's what they teach us, right? It, it, they, 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 they teach us, oh, you got to be the best in the world. You got to be number one. You have to be the top of the top of the top, right? But sometimes it's not the case. Not everyone can be number one. Right. And when you, until you can understand that, you, 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 you have to figure out what else can you do? Because if you can't be number one and number one is your goal, then what can you do, right? It has to be something because if there's nothing, then that can make you want to quit. That can make you want to give up, right? And I thought, so the first thing I did, I said, you know what? Let me stop trying to be number one because by trying to be the best and thinking I am the best, I'm not learning, right? So I was really failing because I wasn't learning anything because I thought I knew everything, mm. right? And so I say, you know what, Wally? Instead of trying to beat this guy who's been playing nine times longer than you have, how about just get five points, right? Because I wasn't even getting, listen, I wasn't getting five points in four games total. I was getting destroyed. So then what I would do is I would say, okay, well, you know what? Let's just get five points. It's four out of seven games. We get five points in one game, we win, right? So I would fight just to get five points. Once I got five points in one game, I would go, yo! And people thought I was mad. They were like, what's wrong with this dude? He just lost 4-0. Why is he happy, right? But I made this goal, that, I, and, and this is something I like to talk about. These Some people call it smart goals. I call it goals that actually make sense. In your mm -hmm. life, you have to make real goals that make sense, right? You, you, it, you, you can't say, yo, I'm going to be an NBA superstar and you're four foot three, <laughs> right? Because that's not happening. Right. But in school, in school, they teach us this shit. This, this is the, listen, it, it's funny. This is the problem. They teach us in school, you can be anything you want. You can't be anything you want. It's bullshit. It, it, it's a lie. You can be anything you want within reason. That I can I can take. But you can't tell people you can be anything you want in the whole world because it's just not true. And when I figure this out, now it's just for me. You know what? Let me not. Let me stop trying to be anything I want, and let me just get five points. Let me start from just crawling, and I would get five points. And then I would say, you know what? Let me get five points in every game. I would get five points in every game. And I would listen, and I would celebrate like I won the Olympics. I'm telling you, this is why every player in the world who's big knows me. They know me for this shit because I would lose 4-0, but I got five points in every game. So I would go, yeah, I would get very hyped. Because, you know, more importantly, when you make small goals, you have to celebrate them. If you don't yes. celebrate them, it's kind of meaningless. So I celebrated the goals. So I went from that to getting one game to winning matches. And that's how I started to. But then I realized when I lost, the media would come to me. The cameras would come to me. The interview would come to me. And I was like, hmm. And then I, 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 I figured it out. It wasn't so much about my skill. It was about my performance. Yes. It was about the show that I was putting on without even knowing that I was putting on a show. I was just being me, right? And and then I realized, like, wait a minute. And 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 when it when when it really came, uh, when I really got to understand it, I was in China. I was in China, and I've been to China many times. And um, for some reason, in the qualification round, they would put me on the TV. I would I would have two TV matches. That's impossible. You get a TV match in the main round. Right. And you're very lucky if you get a TV match in a qualification round. I was getting two. And, and I was like, this is crazy. And so once I, I got upset and I went to the organizer that says, hey, 
Can you please take me off the TV table? I just played on the TV table. Can you put me on another table? Why? Why you? I, I said, you know, it was crazy. Why you put me on the TV table to get my ass kicked? Like it didn't make sense. And the guy told me, the organizer said, Wally, Wally, you are good for TV. And then I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? There's no one like me in the world that plays this sport. There's no one that's that 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 brings the energy that 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 gangster, you know. Hood energy. There's no one that brings that 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 fat, that style that that flair. You know, everything I did was extremely different than everyone else, right? So then, once I realized that, I was like, wait a minute, I don't need to be number one in the world. Who? How am I going to be number one? I'm going to beat China. How? Right. Good luck. I, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Korea can't beat China. No. So I'm going to beat China. It's not going to happen. So then I realized, oh my god, you know what? I have something that everyone doesn't have. I have great showmanship. Mm. So then that helped me to win more matches and get better. You know why? Because I had no pressure to be number one. Let me put on a show for people. Let me go out there and perform. So every time I went to a country, I learned something in their language that I could shout out to the audience. These are things I did on purpose. So if I was in China, if I was in China and I was playing a match against someone, Right, I would go really loud, Jio, and everybody would be like, "Oh shit, black guy saying Jio, wow!" And, and and I would do this in every country. And what would happen was the fans would go crazy for it. You hear a black dude with bleached hair, looking like Dennis Rodman, shouting Jio. It, it, it's the craziest thing ever. And so then I was like, "Oh my god, man, I'm just gonna perform." And that's what I did every time I went to go play. It was never, after that point, it was never about winning the match. Although I was playing to the best of my ability, but it was more about performing for the audience, yes. giving the audience a show. Because I knew that there was no way I was going to be number one. So, Sometimes we have to accept things in our lives that are not possible, right? I, I, I think, like I said, people tell you, everything in this world is possible. No, it's not. Right. It's possible within reason, Right. There was no way I was going to beat China. Yeah. It's never going to happen, right? So I accepted that. And then I say, you know what? I'm the showman of this sport. I'm the Dennis Rodman of this sport. Now look mm -hmm. at Dennis Rodman. No one, listen, Dennis Rodman was the NBA's leading rebounder for a long time. No yes. one knew who the hell Dennis Rodman was until he started wearing these dresses and skirts. Like no one, no one knew Dennis Rodman. But if you look... If you look at the stats, for a long time, he was NBA's leading rebounder. No one even knew him because, first of all, I mean, well, even when he came onto the Bulls, um, Jordan just, it was all about Jordan anyway. Yeah, of course. Right? So who's Dennis Rodman? No one knew. But he was smart. You saw what he did? He started wearing all kinds of weird shit, started doing all kinds of weird shit. And all of a sudden, oh, shit, that's Dennis Rodman. Yeah, he's the number one leading rebounder. He's been the number one leading rebounder, right? Right. So... So it, it's the same thing. It, it was just me putting on a show. Every, every country I went, I put on a show. You know, I tried to make the most fan, the most fantastic point. That one, you know, it, it's that one point. Like, for example, if, if you follow tennis, one of my favorite tennis players who I love to death and I know personally is Gail Monfils, mm. the French guy, Gail Monfils. And the reason why I like Gail Monfils, will he be number one? Never. Will he ever win a, 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 a major? No. But if he's playing, I need to watch it because mm. I know he's going to do something where I'm going to be like, yo, did you see that? Right? He's an entertainer. He's a showman. He's an entertainer. Everything he does is about entertaining the crowd. Yes. Right? And that's why he's so popular. And, mm. and, and, and that's what I do uh, with my sport, man. I'm, I'm a showman. I entertain. Right, you see me playing in videos with my cell phone, right? I do it. It's, it's entertainment, right? And not only is it entertainment, it also lets you know that this sport's not easy. And if I can beat you with a cell phone, then you know you have to rethink now, right? But yes. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a for me. There's with my sport. There's a lot of performance. There's so, so. I mean, I, right now, um, we're gonna open up a club, a new location, um, near Times Square in the old Carolines, where Carolines used to be. 
Oh shit. And yeah. 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 So, so that's our space. So, um, for the openings, we do these shows. Like we have ping pong shows where we get two players, uh, to play for money and, 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 and I'm the MC and it's a show, right? It's, it's a big show. And, uh, for this one, I'm going to do, um, the show, like I did, uh, the, our first opening 14 years ago, 14 years ago, I made a two person Broadway, like a Broadway style ping pong show oh where, God. where there was a story mm. about what was going on. Right. And, and yeah, man, it's, it's, I, I, I figured it out and I cracked the code seriously. Right. I didn't become popular and famous because I was the best player in the world because <laughs> I'm not right. Not even close. Uh, but so it's funny. I, I so agree with you and that like, you can be anything, probably not right. Like you, like you could wedge yourself into something, but in the grand scheme of things, no, you probably can't. What I will say is that something you can be number one at that no one else in the world at is being yourself. Yes. So the fucking path is not figuring out how do I beat everyone else in all this bullshit? It's like, how do I be myself in whatever it is that I'm doing? Cause no one can be me. It is impossible right. for you to be me, no matter how much you work or try. So if I'm being right. myself, I'm creating something that no one else can do, whatever that happens to look like, right? Um, the other thing I was thinking of, and like, uh, this was right after the All-Star game, uh, Damian Lillard was getting interviewed. And someone on Twitter was like, see what loyalty gets you? You stayed in, in Portland and you never won a chip. And he was like, my life is fucking amazing. <laughs> like, I'm rich. I do music. <laughs> like I just won the three point contest. Like my kids are set for life. Like, okay. I didn't win a chip, but like my life is glorious. And right. we, we put so much pressure on being the best right. and we completely miss like, there's so much goodness in or at number one, near number one, not number one, being mon fils, being yourself. Right. It's like we chase these things because they're easy to understand but they're, they're fucking useless. <laughs> like right. being number one is ultimately not that valuable in the context of what you can accomplish in your life. If you just pursue yourself, like, right. ah, I wish That's more true. people true. understood that. I think they'd be <laughs> a lot happier. I think people would be a lot happier if they weren't desperate to get a ranking or a title yes. or whatever yes. the fuck it is. Cause you get it. And then you realize like, Ooh, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I value. I don't know why I did this, but now I have it. And so now I don't right. want to let it go because I just sacrificed my whole life to get it. But now I'm miserable. So I'm trapped in this prison of like, I'm very fancy and I'm very unhappy. Which like, right. I don't know. That doesn't sound like a great place to end up in the grand uh, scheme of things. Like I could think of better. That's, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely agree with that. That's, um, yeah. I always say that um, like when I talk to younger, younger athletes, you know, I always tell them that your biggest battle in your life as an athlete is not against the person across from you. It's against yourself. That's the biggest number one battle that you're going to have. It's the one within yourself, not the yes. person across from you. Yes. Yes. I got a thousand percent, a thousand percent. So like, you've had this crazy run with ping pong. You're the club you're talking about is spin, which there's now multiple locations and getting more and more people into ping pong, which is amazing. Like what, what are you, what are you obsessing about these days other than this one minute video? Like, what are you really excited about for, for projects in the future and, and oh, what you want to go do? Yeah. Like, like right now, um, right now, uh, my story is live on MSG network, MSG and cool. MSG network. So, so yeah. it's, 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 it's airing now and, um, uh, for, for black history month. And then um, I think at the end of the month, it will be um, on YouTube. And then uh, I have a, a film company that's going to do uh, um, a featured movie about my life story, which is really cool because I've, I've been talking with an insane amount of film companies uh, since my New York Times article. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of film companies and all of them were just trying to either buy the story or option mm -hmm. it or things that I think are, aren't beneficial to me and my story. So I just kind of like either turned everyone down and just ignored certain emails. And then finally, um, I met a company who um, is all about telling the story the right way. 
which means that uh, they're not trying to buy the story. I have a say in what goes on. If I don't like it, it doesn't get pushed out. And that's and that's the only way I'm going to do it, right? It's, it's because, you know, there's, there's certain things in my life which need to be told exactly the way they are. Not not to say, not not saying that, oh, you know what? Like when I tell you about when I almost killed my stepfather and my mom, uh, I could see a movie company saying, well, you know what? It's a better movie if he actually did it. No, it's not. I'm living. And that's not right. the truth. <laughs> like, yeah. no, that, that is exactly what's... So that... So that's one of the reasons why that is that particular thing is one of the reasons why uh, I, I don't sell my story. And I've had some really good offers, but sure, it, it, it's not worth it. You know, yeah. I, I, I want the story told the right way. Right. Well, and I, I applaud your willingness to protect the, the value of a true story. You know, yeah. and like, and it's it's not. I mean, like the moth exists, right? Like the power of true story is not necessarily new, but it is crazy how quickly people are like, ooh, we just tilted yeah, yeah. this and did this and move that like no like it's enough like the story is already miraculous we don't need any more bells and whistles to make right. it amazing we don't and, and, and you know I, I did a lot of research and, and one of the things that kind of scared me a little bit it says that um if you sell your rights to your life story to a movie company the movie company has the right to depict you in any way they want this is a fact. So if you sell your story, they own it. And they can say, hey, you know what? I, I don't like him as this character. Let's change it a little bit. Let's, let's, let's you know, and I'm still alive. Right. <laughs> you, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah, maybe if I was dead, okay, it's different, right? I'm not here, but I'm alive. So, so you can't take my life story, change it around, and make it not, you know, make it not exactly what it is. I'm still walking around, right? Oh yeah, gosh. so so um finally I found one and 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 they're and they're good and we, we had our last talk um a month ago. Okay. It was a series, it was over a year, over a year we've been talking. Wow. And then finally, um you know, I, I said it's a good idea. I, I agree, and then now they're pitching. So cool. Let's see what happens. Amazing. Amazing. Um God, that would be that would be exciting and and a whole new thing for you to pursue. One last question, like I, you, well, hmm, I'm gonna have to come up with a different question because it was gonna be what advice would you give to someone getting into ping pong? But I feel like the piece of advice if you're competing against yourself is about as good as you could get. So instead, what I'm gonna go to is like, if you could go back in time to that younger, more violent version of yourself who was angry and in the gang and with your narcissistic stepfather, what would you tell him? Um, it's an interesting question. So it's, you actually ask it a different way. Uh, usually, usually for this kind of question, um, I would say I wouldn't change anything. And the only reason why I wouldn't change anything is because a lot of the things, a lot of the success that I have today is because I actually went through that stuff. Of course. If, if I never went through that stuff. I, 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 I I wouldn't be the kind of person that wants to be, wants to uh, 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 make sure it's successful by any means, right? I, I might be the person who might give up. So those things I wouldn't change. But you did mention the violent part of myself. That um, I wish I wasn't as violent mm. as I was um, when I was younger, um, because even though it's a long time now. Uh, the violent part of you doesn't leave. Like you have to control it. Like like mm. people think, oh, you know, you changed, and the violent part is just gone. It just disappeared. Did not does it? It's 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 always going to be a part of you, right? Because I've been doing it for so for so long. So I would tell myself, bro, chill. Like like mm. take it easy. You know, like calm down a little bit. You know, you know like 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 those kind of things. Because it's it's still. Yeah. It's still in me. Like people rarely see it, but there are times when when I'm pushed and and it comes out. And, and I'm very mm -hmm. I've been very good at controlling at controlling um, that thing. Um, but sometimes people just go too far, and then it 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 it, it, it just it like comes out. So I have to always stay in control. So yeah, I would go back and tell myself, chill, 
just chill, bro. Chill, chill. You're getting too angry. Chill. Slow down. Slow down. Chill out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's probably it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that. I, I do think that I'm glad that there is more and more conversation about mental health in this country. But I, I think the piece that is still missing is people think that, like, you fix it. No. No. Like, whatever weird fucking voice you have in your head. Like, for me, it's around eating stuff. I've had it for 25 years now. And I thought at some point, like, I just wouldn't hear the voice or I wouldn't feel the urge in a certain way. And like, no, it's still there. It's there the same way it was in high school and college and all of that. It's just that I've grown up and I've learned to see that voice and like, oh, I know what you are. I know why right. you're saying these things. And like, it's, right. it's cool. I don't have to listen to you. I appreciate you that, you know, you're just doing your thing. That's fine. But like depression does not fucking dissipate and eating disorders don't dissipate and violence. It sounds like doesn't dissipate. Trauma doesn't dissipate. Like that voice is present. It's about your ability to love yourself and find calm and peace in the face of it and not choose to follow the voice. Like Right, right. And 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 the, and, and, and also to even understand that it's happening to you. To understand that you're going through it. It's so important. You know, yesterday I was on Clubhouse and, and this dude came in and, and and we have a girl uh, uh who's who's very, very strong. She she she's she, <laughs> And, and and but 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 she's she's very straightforward. And the dude came in and with this weird energy, and he was definitely going through something, but he didn't realize he was going through something, mm. right? So 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 she kind of like you know, sternly said, "Hey, are you okay? Are you going through something? Do do, do you need help or something? Like like this?" And he he just kept going, but he, he wasn't hearing. Then eventually. He kind of understood what he was doing and and and, and what was happening, but mm. in the initial point, he didn't he didn't understand. And, and I think you know it's very important that um, with you know with mental health and everything, that knowing that you're going through something when you're going through it is extremely important. Like like just knowing that okay, I'm feeling this way now because of this. All right, it's happening. Okay, let me take a step back and and. And relax because sometimes, like I know, that sometimes it doesn't happen often, but sometimes I'll get really angry or mm. really violent. Like I, I'll just feel really just angry, and if I don't catch myself, right, it'll be me feeling violent, angry for no reason. But there's a reason for it, right? So I have to recognize it right away because if I don't recognize it right away, it'll take one person to just do something that's a little bit out of the ordinary and then I'll just boom, flip, right? Mm. Especially when I'm feeling like that because then in my mind, I'll be looking. I'll be looking for someone. And, 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 and you know, that's how, you, you know, the brain is a powerful thing, man. You start manifesting this shit mm. and lo and behold, someone's going to come and it's going to set you up. So, so now... If, if, if I, ref, I now when I feel really violent and I feel angry, I know where it's coming from automatically. Like, hey, this is when you was a kid. This is from your stepfather. Yo, chill. And I just and, and then I'm like, oh, you know, okay, yeah, I got it. And then just reset my mind and and just chill. Yeah. But, but yeah, yeah, the first step is actually knowing that it's happening. Yeah, that self awareness. It's everything. Oh man. Well, Wally, I so appreciated this conversation. Thank you so much for yeah, taking man. the time. This was awesome. And uh, like I said, when I'm in New York, I'll definitely hit you up. I'd love to, I'd, I'll take a table with you. You can beat the shit out of me. I will lose four matches in a row. 21 then you're going on my TikTok. You know that, right? <laughs> That's right. But you know what? I'm going to scrape for five points over four <laughs> games. I'm just going to fight for that. And I'm going to fucking act like I won the Super Bowl. That's if it. I can get, <laughs> if I can get my five, if I can get one point, Super yeah, Bowl, yeah. victory Yo, dance no, the whole way. It. Oh my god! I had someone do that to me one time. Like they came to play me, and and, and I think this is something that they had in their mind. I'm sure they had it in their mind. They came yeah. to play me, right? And usually the first point, I have to see like what you got, especially when I'm playing with my phone. Like I, I, you know, I, I can give you a couple of points because you played at 21, and then I understand what you got, and then I can focus. This guy came in, served the ball, smashed the ball, and went yay! And they didn't play anymore. Fucking guy, had me pissed off, man. I was so tight. He was like, "I won, I won," and just really, 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 it just left. He left the club. He just left. I never seen the guy again. He just left. Fucking oh my guy. god, <laughs> humans. 
Oh, um, man. that was too funny, too funny. All right, man. Thank you so, so much for listening to Stage Dive. I'm having so much fun having all these conversations and meeting these wonderful, wonderful people. But I appreciate that this is also going out to you, the person who is listening. So my request, my ask, my desire, if you have any curiosities, questions, guest recommendations, suggestions for the podcast, please, please, please send us an email at stagedivepodcast at gmail.com. We read every single email that comes through. We will get back to you. We really do want to hear what you love about the podcast, things that you think could improve, and how we can make this a better show for you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much.